This episode of The Meat House is brought to you by Amoretti, the ultimate manufacturer of brewers' natural infusions, craft purees, and concentrates to bring your next batch to the next level. Click on the link in the episode description below to see their full lineup of flavors. Use promo code MEATHOUSE at checkout to save 15% off your next order. Ordering on a little bit too tart for me, uh, but as it warmed up, just the way I kind of perceived that flavor, it kind of rounded out a little bit and, and kind of that sharp tartness that I was getting kind of mellowed out a little bit. And some of the honey flavor started to expand a little bit more as well. Um, and, and I enjoyed it more at, at a warmer temperature. So um, something I'll, I'll kind of play around with here. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about yeast. Uh, I don't want to go into the whole yeast brand and, and everything else about yeast but let's let's talk about yeast starters uh and the reason why i bring up this discussion because i ran into a guy uh last week uh doing a little shopping at my local homebrew store picking up some yeast because i have a new project i'm uh, just doing a straight out dry uh traditional mead with wildflower honey that i have and I, I was looking for something different than the typical 71Bs and D47s and stuff I was using. And James at uh, Simi Valley uh, Homebrew, uh, who has been making mead and wine for about 10 years, and we got into this discussion about you know the, all the different meads and, and 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 everything, whatever you know what's available. And he suggested that I try this Y yeast product, and uh, I know you're both familiar. That this is that smack pack uh, deal. Uh, typically, it's uh, you know refrigerated. You have to keep it in the refrigerator. Uh, but there's a there's a sealed. Uh, I, I don't know which is what. I, I suppose that the nutrient is in the big package and the yeast is in the small package. It could be vice versa, but I don't know. But uh, it's in liquid form, and uh, one or the other inside this uh, other this other plastic package inside. Well, when you when you crush the package, when you pop that inner package in there, it all combines, and you shake it up and just set it on the counter. Takes anywhere from three to five hours. Uh, refrigerator. It can take up to 12 hours, apparently. Um, but the package kind of, it, it, it kind of bulges out. And, uh, you know, things go to work. Now, I don't know if it's, I presume it's some kind of go firm formula or something, some kind of nutrient. Uh, have you two uh, uh, used it before? I have sparingly. Back in my beer brewing days, um, the okay. first the first liquid yeast that I was actually exposed to is White Labs, which actually comes in a small glass vial and doesn't require like a smack pack or anything like that. Basically, what what I would do is you know when I'd start brewing the batch, I'd grab that out of the fridge, let it come up to room temperature, and then pitch it directly into um, into the wort at that point, um, have used the Y yeast maybe once or twice and I don't have anything against it. It, it worked just fine. Um, but recently I've just been using more of the, the dry yeast. Yeah. Well, I guess, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, however you look at it, what, whatever the contents are inside, it's, it's a yeast, uh, uh, and a nutrient that you combine, uh, and, after this thing expands, uh, then you, uh, of course, I mean, the temperature control is still is still the same as anything else. I mean, you don't want to pitch the stuff at uh, at different temps. So once you bring your your yeast package, at, at, you know, up to room temperature, somewhere in the 70, 75 degree range, uh, make sure your must is at least seventy degrees, uh, and then you pitch this uh, in. You know, stir it up, mix it up, and, and let it go. But uh, I was a little, I was getting a little worried 
uh, I used a dry mead, uh, Y yeast, I think it's 4632, if I'm not mistaken. And I was getting a little worried because, like, you know, 18, 20 hours later, I'm staring at the airlock and nothing's moving. Uh, and I thought, wow, this is really, uh, this is taking some time. And I th- actually, th- I look back at it now. I know we talked before the show. I, th- I think it was bo- it was longer than 24 hours. It was almost three days. Uh, this thing sat there, and that's the point. Where I thought, you know what? I'm just going to throw a, a package of 71B in it uh, and forget that Y yeast thing. But I got up. Uh, I think it was on the third day, and looked, and the airlock was. I mean, it was like a freight train had come roaring into town. I mean, I think it was bubbling so hard. Uh, they finally took off. So I'm eager to try this out and see where it's going to wind up. Now, this is a dry mead. It's going to go all the way down to uh, 100 or below, uh, you know, in the 998 uh, uh, area. So I'm I'm expecting a, a dry wine-like mead out of this. So I'm not really looking forward to that. Um, but... You know, when it comes to pitching yeast, I know there's a lot of discussion out there about creating starters and rehydration processes and methods. Uh, what have you guys, uh, just to start with you, what, what have you found that works best for you? And is there a particular method that you find better than others? You know, I've, I've tried a few different things. I've tried the Y smackbacks, and, you know, my two cents is that they work pretty good for um for beer i'm not as big a fan for mead um although realistically i've only used the dry mead one once um, and that was the very first batch i ever made um subsequently i've tried the sweet mead ones a couple of times and not been particularly thrilled with the results compared to um some of the dry meads i've tried yeah um that said i've tried the uh the dry meads a few different i'm sorry the uh so the dry yeast a few different ways, um, making just a, a basic uh, warm water starter and then kind of tempering the must into that. Uh, I've used GoFirm recently, and I've liked the, the results I get from that and a relatively uh, quick and easy pickup of uh, fermentation that comes with that. Yeah. Um, I've used a couple ale yeasts that have recommended they just be sprinkled on top of the must. Uh, so I've done that, and that came out okay um i'm so far i'm liking the go firm uh it, it seems to yield pretty consistent pretty rapid results um my my major concern with anything that takes too long to get started is that it's allowing for either a, a wild yeast or a bacteria to cross contaminate and take over before the yeast really get up to the population to to be moving around so yeah yeah well, when you uh, was there was there something in particular about the liquid yeast that you didn't? I mean, I, I, you know, what was it about the sweetness? It was too sweet, left it too sweet, or uh, oh no, the, the, the flavor sweet, somehow, or it wasn't the sweetness level at all that I disliked. Actually, it was just that the yeast came off as, and in, in more than one batch, it came off as kind of temperamental. Um, it, it needed to be a little bit more babied. It needed more uh, more nutrients, more attention. I had to degas it a lot longer than I usually do to keep it going, uh, to keep the pH from dropping. Um, it's just not my favorite strain of yeast cubes. It seems like it's a little bit more trouble than it's worth when I can uh, when I can get decent results from um, other yeasts available to me. Yeah. I had, uh, you know, when I was up there at the Simi Valley, uh, you know, this little brew store up there, blue uh, home brew store, uh, talking to James, uh, he had mentioned the fact that he dry and he's been doing it that way for 10 years. <laughs> so, and I, I was a little, I, I didn't know whether to be shocked or, uh, you know, because I mean, he, he had told me when I asked him how long he'd been making, making mead, he said he'd been, you know, doing wines and meads for 10 years. And we got into the discussion about, you know, the different kind of yeast. He's, you know, he says, uh, and I, I asked him about yeast starters, if he made one. And then he tells me, no, I just dry pitch it. And I thought, wow. You're kidding, right? <laughs> uh, 
because there's a lot out there, you know, about making a starter and building up the use cells. And uh, I wanted to have this conversation with him, uh, but couldn't because there were other customers in the store. But I, I you know, I, I guess it works, Aaron. Do you, you know, I mean, would, do you have a particular way that you pitch your yeast? Do you have a method that you use all the time that seems to work better than others? Yeah, you know, I have the exper- or the the technique that I've been following is just the rehydration method that Sergio outlines on his website, you know, the Mead Made Right website, um, which, you know, involves go firm and and some warm water where you, um, you know, kind of let that, that yeast acclimate to, to the temperature and and rehydrate. Then you slowly temper in small amounts of the must and, and kind of go that route. From what I've seen, you know, the starters, definitely can be a good thing um from from what i've researched it seems like that's more something that is a, a really good idea in higher gravity beers um just because from my understanding the ale yeasts may be a little more finicky with with some of those higher gravity worts versus some of the the wine yeasts that we use more traditionally in mead making um you know they they handle those higher gravity musts better um so, so creating the starter may not always be required. You know, I'm, as we're sitting here discussing this, I can't help but think of some of those ridiculously high gravity, uh, needs that, that Chris puts together. Chris, you yeah. Know. Yeah, exactly. And, and I don't think he uses a starter method either. So, um, but, but then again, I know he uses 71B, which is just a workhorse of a meat yeah. of a yeast as well. Um, but that's well, that's kind of what I've seen is the starters are are definitely recommended for higher gravity beers. I know Chris uses go firm and you know the liquid rehydration method in a and he 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 picked up on uh, I think it was um Ken Schramm's method. He doesn't do it in a jar or you know a, a cup. He actually does it in a pan. Uh you know, with just uh, just enough water to bring it up off the bottom, sprinkles his yeast over the top of the pan because apparently the surface area, the greater the surface area, the better the hydration rate for the yeast, uh, I guess. But Yeah, and he doesn't stir the yeast in either from, from huh. how I recall it. I think he just lets it kind of naturally – hydrate itself and kind of sink into the water at its own natural rate yep. as opposed to, to forcing it by stirring. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, one of the, uh, you know, I make wine here at home too. And I, I belong to this uh, other forum, uh, you know, this winemaking forum. And uh, there's a lot of people there that, you know, prefer the dry pitch. Uh, I, and I don't know if there's really that much difference between, making wine and making mead uh, you're just basically replacing the fermentables with grape juice and honey uh, but you know it's a common practice to just sprinkle the yeast over the top of your must don't stir it let it automatically rehydrate it at its own pace and let it fall through and, and uh, start working you know so exactly I'm, and I'm sitting here thinking, okay, I go through all this trouble of, you know, like Chris, I, I get my pan of water out and I get the temperature right and I mix my go firm in and uh, wait for the for the temperature to come down to a compatible temperature for the yeast. And I sprinkle my yeast on there and then put it in the microwave. I do everything Chris does. Man, I sit there and wait. And then here's this guy who's been making mead for 10 years. All he does is just sprinkle it on the top. <laughs> you know, so. You think, what am I going to all this trouble for? <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, apparently he's, he's won a few competitions here and there and, uh, makes some pretty good stuff. And he actually sells his, uh, he's got a liquor license here in California that he's able to sell his meads and his wines that he makes. 
through his uh, through his uh, store there. So, um, you know, so he's got to be doing something right. So, I you know I got to put that on my on my to do list. You know, dry pitch yeast into meat and see how that works. Yeah, give it a try with a one gallon batch, and worst case, you know, you're out a gallon. Yeah, I mean, and we're going to try to get him on the show so that we can go into a little more detail about it. But, you know, I mean, I, uh, and, you know, beer making is another, uh, you know, I, I made my first batch of beer when we were off. And, uh, you know, the instructions were to just sprinkle the yeast over the top of the, of, of the well, it's called wort at that point. And so that's what I did. Uh, and I'm thinking, gosh, you know, aren't, aren't I supposed to like rehydrate this stuff? And uh, and I used the uh, Safel uh, S A S A F Ale O five and uh, just sprinkled it on the top, you know. And it, it took off like gangbusters too, you know. There you go. You know, and it's funny that you mentioned that about the liquid yeast taking longer. I had noticed the same type of a thing actually when I first started getting into beer brewing was that batches that used a liquid yeast, it seemed like it would take, you know, 48 hours or longer before it would start to ferment versus the, the ale or the dry yeast. It seems like you'd pitch that and sometimes 12 hours later it just took off like a rocket. And I don't remember the reason for that, but um, I remember mentioning it to the, the owner of the homebrew supply shop and he had a scientific reason for why that's the case um so so i think there's something to that well you know and i'm not a scientist and uh, jeff maybe you understand it more than uh, you know more than i do chris could probably explain it too but i really don't get the you know this whole this whole go firm thing's got me bugged because Typically, when, you know, if I rehydrate yeast without using the GoFirm, uh, you know, it foams up like mad after 15, 20 minutes. And, you know, at that point, you know, it's really active and that's when I pitch it. But if I mix the GoFirm in and, you know, rehydrate my yeast, it just sits there like a brown scum that you would find at the bottom of a wooden barrel. I mean, it doesn't do anything. You know, yeah, 15, I mean, 20 minutes later, it just sits there. You know? I have pretty much the same experience I've noticed. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the delay is related to, to the go firm. You know, because yeah, exactly like you said, if I don't use it, the previously, like, it's bubbling up like crazy. I'm tempering it and uh, it it damn near overfills my measuring cup by the time I actually get around to pitching it. Yeah. Uh, with with the go firm, it kind of sits around and sits around and sits around. And as I understand it, the the go firm is full of uh, macronutrients that are to promote cellular health in yeast and make sure that they're they're off to a good start before they get pitched into the the nust. Um, it, it's not like a nutrient that is supposed to feed the yeast, but it promotes um, healthy cell walls and uh, Good cellular function, good uh, division, and early uh, early cellular health. The yeast uh, microbiology is not my specialty, obviously. Um, yeah, me neither. So i I've been using it. I've I've liked it. Okay. Um, I am curious as to whether uh, you know whether that's uh, that's terribly. Uh, necessary at this point um that that may be another experiment to try in the future uh two batches side by side one with a, a go from starter and one with just a, a regular uh wet starter maybe a third one with just the sprinkled on top of the bus yeah Let's see what happens i know if chris were here i mean our you know mad scientist uh mississippi chris I mean, his medical training, I'm sure the education that he had as far as being a doctor also helps, too. He understands all this cell structure and and, and whatnot. Uh, and uh, he might be able to, to help explain it a little bit further. But um, I, I just, you know, when I, when, I, when I mix it up with the go for a minute, it just sits there and does nothing. I, I, get, I get worried. You know, I'm thinking, oh, is this yeast dead? 
you know, I mean, uh, I put it in my must. Is it, is it really going to work? And you sit there and I, I find myself going to bed with my fingers crossed, hoping that, you know, praying that, you know, get on my hands and knees and pray, please, ease, come, lo- come to life. Uh, and sure enough, it does. But uh, you still can't get over the fact that, you know, it just sits there and does nothing. And, uh, uh, you know, but, uh, I, you know, I, I think you got a good point there. An experiment. I mean, you know, here, here's another experiment. This is the, again, the fun thing about making meat is the experimental aspects. What works best for you? Well, yeah. put small batches together and find out. So now, okay, after talking to this guy who's been making meat for 10 years, do I even have to worry about go firm? You know, uh, can I just dry pitch, incorporate my nutrient schedule when it starts up and go for it? I don't see why not. What do you think? You know, I, in the past, I've been perfectly good need to without, uh, uh, without go firm. I think most every meat I've made has been uh, any meat I've made that's won an award has been made without go firm just because I started using go firm so recently. Um, I don't see why not. I mean the the um, the acid test here is whether you get results you like as well um, without go firm as you do with go firm. I think. Yeah. Well, you know, and I'm sure, you know, you know, it might even be a question we can pose to somebody like Sergio Mutella. Uh, and, uh, you know, he might be able to even help explain it too. You know, exactly how important is go firm to rehydrating yeast? Is it really all that necessary? I mean, what are the risks that you run not using it? Uh, well, and I don't want to put words into Chris's mouth, but I know on a couple of occasions he's talked about um, his preference to use go firm on particularly high gravity batches um, just because of the stress involved on the yeast. It, yeah. it may be a case where it is more useful in situations where the yeast might be more stressed um, for the, the home mead maker making a, you know, a, a, a medium alcohol content to even a, like a lighter session mead uh, where the the yeast is just not going to be particularly stressed out, it may not be as important. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I know he started his stuff up like, you know, 156 area of the hydrometer, which is like whacked out way up there. <laughs> you know? Blows my mind completely. <laughs> I know. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> well, you know, in particular the this cherry thing because of the tartness that's involved and everything else. I mean, he's got that cherry thing down to a science, and uh, you know, was able to get out from under that medicinal cough syrupy type flavor that uh, is associated with doing cherry, you know, melomel. So. Uh, and that's the thing is like those ridiculously high gravity meads he puts together from from how he's described it. Usually he's balancing that high residual sweetness that you're left with with very tart types of fruits. Yeah. You know, the, the cherry, the black currant, um, raspberries and, and things like that. Just flavor bombs in, in those little fruits. Yeah. Yeah, in that respect, I can see where, you know, and I understand because Chris has talked about it before, and I've even had offline conversations about it with him. I don't particularly, you know, I mean, the, the science stuff kind of goes into one and out the other because I'm just, I'm not, I'm not a scientist. But uh, he makes it, you know, he puts it in layman's terms to, you know, just about anybody can understand it. But I know it has something to do with cell wall structure. Uh, it talks, you know, he talks about the yeast being like a little community that grows, uh, and that's what you need to have for this high gravity stuff, uh, that he does. I mean, you know, they got to go in like gangbusters and, 
you know, without the risk of, of, of being murdered by, by the excessively high amount of, of sugar, of honey. So, uh, but uh, we'll try to get him to talk about it maybe on a, on a future show. But, um, you know, I was just interested in, in finding out, you know, what your preference was as far as yeast rehydration because, you know, you, you go to you go to different uh, forums out there. Gamid is one that comes to mind. And there, there's people who swear by one method and one method only. And if you don't do it this way, you know, you're going to have all kinds of problems. So I guess I was looking for, uh, you know, I mean, what what is the potential? What what if you don't rehydrate the yeast? What if you just pitch it in dry? I know one guy who does and does it with success, uh, and he makes he makes a lot of mead, and uh, so I'm eager to try that out for sure. Right, and like you were talking about with the beer and the uh, the safe ale. Uh, USO five, um, it's a dry pitch. They recommend it right on the package. I've done the same thing with the the SO four, which is it's an English ale yeast as opposed to an American ale yeast, essentially as it's been explained to me, um, into mead, and it came out great. It, it's uh, the first thing I used in um, uh, one of the first meads that I tried oaking on uh, the uh, the hop mead that I've made. Uh, I used that on. And no, I I thought it worked fine. So um, I I think it goes back to again, you know, what are you trying to accomplish, and um, do you notice a difference yeah. for yourself? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's yeah. interesting. So Jeff, you said that um, you just dry pitched the ale yeast. The the first couple times I used it, yeah, I just uh, you know I. Bear in mind, the first couple of years that I was I was at this hobby, I wasn't, uh, you know, I didn't have things like uh, Sergio's website or uh, uh, I, I wasn't very active on forums and things. I just kind of, well, you know, they made this yeast. They know best. I'll just follow the directions in the package, right? Sure, sure. And that's, that's interesting. It came out fine. <laughs> Well, uh, that, the reason I uh, sorry to interrupt too. I, the no, reason I'm just kind of interested and curious about that is with um, the hopped meads that that I had just put together recently. I did end up rehydrating with Go Firm and, and that whole process. So I'm they came out pretty darn good so far. I mean, granted, I've I've just sampled you know a couple couple tastes out of each of them after primary. Um, so I don't know. It's just as we're talking here, I think uh, some additional experimentation would be worthwhile with with just dry pitching some of this. Oh, absolutely. I know that, uh, you know, as I mentioned, that beer recipe that I put together, I mean, even the instructions, you know, said to, you know, just dry pitch. But I also did notice uh, on that package, you know, like you were saying, Jeff, that it, you know, it just says dry pitch, you know, <laughs> uh, because I, I was looking all over it, you know, trying to find, okay, what what's the rehydration right here? I mean, how much water am I supposed to use? What temperature is this thing? And there's nothing on the package whatsoever. Uh, so I thought, well, okay, you know, dry pitch it is. Uh, maybe that's what you're supposed to do. Uh, but uh, so... You know that uh, you know again. I mean, here here's the experiment. Uh, set up some uh, one gallon batches, uh, some small batches. Uh, you know, mix up one with go firm, uh, mix up one without go firm, and dry pitch the third one, and start the time clock and uh, see what happens. You know, uh, sounds like a fun little experiment to see uh, uh, to see. You know, do you really need you know and this is, you know, we're talking, I think, something very standard here, probably something in the neighborhood of 120. I don't know that I'd go above that. I'd probably stay in the 115, 120 range and, and go to, little, you know, to the dry side. I wouldn't sure. get carried away with the honey. Uh, keep it simple, you know. Uh, oh, definitely, especially if we're thinking of, you know, making it an ale yeast that we're using definitely don't don't get go overboard with it 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, if you if you wanted to be really extravagant with this, you could you could uh, split it up into a uh, into nine gallon batches and do uh, three of each at one twenty. Uh, three of each at 90 and three of each at 150 and see how that works out. But that would also give you the, the contrast between like a, a lower starting gravity and a higher starting gravity to see if that affects the stress on the yeast at all. There you go. Um, but you know, that, that is if you have the space for nine, one gallon batches. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Well, uh, I kind of do and kind of don't, but <laughs> I'm trying to cut down here <laughs> um, because I, you know, I, I've got some things going that I'm hoping, you know, like this beer thing. I'm hoping this beer thing works out because uh, it's something that I want to make around Christmas time and 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 hand out to friends and relatives. But this uh, pumpkin thing is another uh, project. I mean, I really like to get a good pumpkin one going. Uh, that's got some good flavors, you know, in, in a mead for for Thanksgiving too. So. Still working on that, one. but um, let's uh, let, let's talk hydro or uh, hydrometers. Let's talk pH meters uh, here. For um, I, I didn't know how important a pH meter was going to be until I I got into making actually a pumpkin mead. And this thing went so far freaking south on me. Uh, to take a sip was like licking the inside of a lead pipe. I mean, this thing was beyond tart. And because of some acid additions that, that I had to make, uh, you know, that were, I don't want to go into the whole reason why it happened or anything, but being new at this, uh, was told by somebody, you know, put this much of this kind of acid, this much of that kind of acid. Well, when I, when I got it within the numbers, okay, uh, where it was supposed to be like, you know, 3.0, 3.2, it had gone completely to the other side. Now we're talking something that's way beyond lemon tart. Okay. Um, so, and I wouldn't have known anything about it. Okay. If I hadn't had the pH meter. So that's the scary side. Okay. Of having one because, you know, and Chris, uh, Chris is a believer that you don't add acid uh, until the very end, he, he he would do it in secondary, just to control the final outcome, not during fermentation, which is where I added it, uh, and uh, or you know I actually was told to add it. So, but the other side of the spectrum, you know, pH meters can give you an idea of where it's headed uh, if it goes the other direction, and that will absolutely bring it to a stop, right? Oh, definitely. And actually, yeah, go ahead. The, um, it was some of the, uh, the wet yeast packs, the, uh, the white yeast that, uh, that clued me on to how important a pH meter is because one of the, uh, and I don't want to say, you know, I'm knocking these, these wet yeasts. I, they're just not, I've just not had good experiences with them. And it may be that I am not, uh, not providing an adequate amount of nutrient for them or, um, I, I may have just a different preference, but, um, the, the sweet mead, uh, yeast that I used crashed and it crashed hard to the point where by the time I finally got myself a pH meter and stuck it in there to see what was going on, I think it was in the neighborhood of 2.7. Yeah. Um, oh, wow. It was that, um, and it, it took a lot of babying to get it back out of, out of that funk and get it anywhere close to, to being finishable. Um, yeah. e even then it still left a lot of residual sugar that I think, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that on some level I bottled that batch with a little bit left to go. Uh, the, the yeast probably could have performed better if I hadn't, if I had, uh, 
provided a less stressed out environment for them. And I, I just kind of chalk that one up to learning. Um, but it was one of those that, no, if, if you're not uh, watching where it's going, it can cause some, some bad problems pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, one direction you, you add, uh, you know, acid to it. If it goes the other direction, why I believe it's potassium carbonate without looking at my little shelf up there behind me, uh, you know, if it goes the other direction. So, but you know, even, even at that, at, you know, if you're using a pH meter and, you know, my recommendation is if it goes, you know, one way or another by one point, even one and a half points, don't get freaked out because, you know, give it a little bit of time. Give it a few days because it may come back. Uh, don't do like I did and just jump on uh, something that, you know, may be askew. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, had I left this pumpkin thing alone, it may have turned out just fine. Uh, you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty, as they say. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I don't think I would be without my pH meter in making, you know, my wines or my meats. Uh, Aaron, do you, do you have a pH meter? Do you use one? I do. So um, the pH meter is something that is – pretty new in my tool belt. Um, I think just within the last maybe seven or eight months, I I purchased it. And um, I've just got a little digital E-Tech City pH meter that I purchased on Amazon. You know, it's the type of thing, it's less than 20 bucks. and, And definitely, I think it's worthwhile. In the batches that I've put together so far, I've been okay without having to buffer with like a potassium bicarbonate or a, a calcium carbonate or something like that. Um, most of the batches I put together have started around, you know, 4.1 to 4.3. Um, I have noticed that as the fermentation, you know, proceeds, the pH level does drop. Um, I've not had it drop to like a danger zone or anything like that. You know, I've um, had it get down to, you know, maybe 3.6 or 3.7. And, you know, from from what I've gathered, it seems like it's, you know, maybe not until you get down below 3.2 where you you really have a problem on your hands. But, um, you know, I I think it's just the type of thing that as as mead makers – being diligent with the notes that we take and, and having good records to fall back on for when we have successes or, or when we have failures, it's definitely worthwhile to, to just have that data point. I mean, the pH level is definitely an important parameter. It's a significant factor in, in the mead making process. And um, if something does go awry, you know, you have a sluggish fermentation or something like that, it, you know, it's, it's definitely – just a, a tool that that is useful for identifying a potential cause. Yeah. Well, I, I know for me it was. I mean, I was really, I was so frustrated. I was so disappointed because I had really so looked forward to putting this recipe together. And I mean, I had a mentor at the time who who is very very well educated in the whole mead making process and. Helping me, uh, and everything. I would report to him daily, uh, all my numbers and everything. And uh, I mean, it just went south. I mean, it just absolutely went south. And I was really, really disappointed. I mean, so disappointed. I mean, we're talking about a five-gallon batch with you know a hundred dollars worth of honey in it, and uh, you know, and probably forty dollars worth of pumpkin product, uh, fresh product, uh, you know. Uh, that we had put in it, but um, plus and, your uh, time and energy as well. Yeah, you know, uh, and something that I kind of learned along the way. Um, you know, when you, whenever you go to a, a class A, you know, a five star, four star restaurant, you know, a chef, even all these shows you see on TV and cooking shows and whatnot. They're constantly telling you taste, 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 taste. 
Uh, and that's what I do when I cook. Uh, I, I'm constantly tasting, reseasoning, you know, fine tuning. And it dawned on me after going through all of that that, hey, why shouldn't this be the same? So I've gotten into the practice. I taste every step of the way. Uh, I'll taste it when I add, you know, before I add nutrient, I'll take another taste after I add nutrient. Uh, I taste every step of the way. And I think that's really a good practice to get into, wouldn't you think? Totally agree. Yeah, that's one of the things that I've started doing as well at least for the first seven days or so during primary fermentation, when I'm pulling out a sample for a gravity reading, a pH reading, um, you know, I'll also pull some out to mix in the nutrients and, and then pitch that back in. Um, but whatever I take that, that I use for taking that gravity and pH reading, I'll taste it too and just see how the, the batch is progressing over time. Um, I, I think you can you can definitely learn from that. Yeah, I, I don't taste it quite that often. I taste it uh, generally um, when I mix the the must together and make sure kind of everything is going right. And I'll taste it um, oh maybe with my last grab or my uh, my last nutrient addition, um, and then again towards the the end of that first week or so when I'm degassing twice a day. Um, just to make sure everything is going in the right direction. Um, I try not to overtaste it just so that I'm, I'm not fretting about it too much. Um, but I, uh, I, I like to keep an eye on where it's going. So yeah. after that, that, uh, last degassing and tasting, I kind of like leave it alone until it's ready to go into secondary. Yeah. And just a side comment, going back to this coffee mead that, that we put together, I have to say the, unfermented must from that mead tasted out of this world. Didn't it? <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Didn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've even taken to drop on a spoonful of honey into my hot coffee in the morning. <laughs> there yeah. you go. <laughs> I mean, it's just something about that, you know? Yep. Uh, and that's why I say, you know, in the beginning, you know, we were talking earlier about that coffee mead. I mean, it, I, I guess for me, as much as I, I really don't like the sweeter side of things, that maybe this coffee thing needs to be on the sweeter side of things to really uh, complement the, the coffee bean itself. And you're right. I mean, my God, that is such a wonderful taste. I could drink a glass of that. I can't, not more than a glass, mind you, but, you know, a little, a little short glass of that would be awesome, uh, uh, you know, on occasion. But, um, you know, Patty, uh, Patty did say something. I caught up on, you know, if you were, if you were, uh, she made a comment in there that I caught. She said it was, it made better Kahlua than the stuff you find in a liquor store. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. Um, you know, so, uh, and Kahlua is typically sweet. I mean, I make homemade Kahlua here at, here at the house uh, and there's a ton of sugar in it. Um, so maybe she's onto something too, you know, um, pH meters. Yeah. You know, 20 bucks or less on, on Amazon. If you don't have one, get one. Uh, and if you need to keep it calibrated, uh, you can use Coca-Cola. Get American. I wouldn't use Mexican because I don't. I didn't even know it's the same stuff. But get Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is always two point five, and you can keep a jar of it. I just keep a little mason jar uh, full of it in the refrigerator. It lasts forever. Uh, because it's, you know, it's all sugar and sugar is a preservative. So, uh, but that's what I use. Uh, maybe about once every six, seven months, I'll, I'll go get a new can of Coke. Uh, you know, but, uh, calibrate it to Coca Cola. I mean, you can't go wrong. 2.5, uh, is the calibration for Coke. 
I just love that tip. I remember when you shared that with me, I had been just researching different calibration techniques. You know, some people will use like a white vinegar or different things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just cracked me up. <laughs> Coca-Cola. There you go. Coca-Cola. Now, the, uh, I, I should mention here, um, much like significant gravity, you can get a little bit of variance with your pH based on temperature. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So that, that's something to be aware of. I mean, if you're if you're calibrating based on Coca Cola that's been in the refrigerator, and you're uh, you're going to go measure the pH on a, um, a a must fermenting at room temperature or a little bit below room temperature, you're going to see a variance there. Um, it, it might not hurt to leave that Coca Cola out on the counter uh, in a jar uh, covered, obviously. Yeah. Um, so nothing gets yeah. into it, but. Uh, instead of leaving it in the fridge. But the, right, if, if you've got a good medium like that for calibration, then uh, by all means, use it. Yeah. And all, you know what? That, uh, that would be an interesting test to do, too, is figure out, you know, what exactly is the temperature variance on that? How much temperature? I, I you know, with, with the, with the because of my experience with the, with the acid and, and, you know, the actually the couple of projects that I did where, where the acid addition just, got carried away with it uh and learning to use the ph uh, meter and everything i don't get i've learned not to get um overly excited uh if i see numbers that don't look good i mean if it drops down to 2.8 yeah you know i'm i'm not gonna get anxious about it I'm going to back off. I'm going to let it go for 24, maybe 32 hours and see where it winds up and then maybe do something. If it's uh, 3.8, 3.9, again, I'm carried away. Uh, I'm going to give it a little bit of time, um, you know, and maybe it won't need anything. Uh but there are extremes too. I mean, if it goes over four, then yeah, there's something definitely wrong. And if it drops under, you know, like two point five or two point four, then yeah, I'm going to start getting a little bit worried uh, and looking for the jar of potassium carbonate. But uh, the acid part, I have to agree with Chris. I don't even think I'd even attempt to put acid in it. I would just wait. I'd wait till it's done. I mean, if if it's a fermentation problem, which can happen, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, it can happen either way, right? Too low, too high can stop fermentation, right? Can kill the yeast. Yes. Well, it's, too high is not necessarily uh, as as big a danger to the yeast as it is uh, that that creates an environment where bacteria may thrive more easily than yeast do. Uh, the yeast are suppressed and the bacteria are promoted and then you get things like Acetobacter or uh, any number of uh, different nasty little critters in there making terrible stuff happen in your yeast. Yeah. Um, generally, if if the the pH falls, on the other hand, it it gets to the point where the yeast is inhibited, but so is everything else, and you just get a flat stall. Yeah. Yeah, and you know sometimes that's you know you can recover from that by uh, making your corrections. Uh, and, uh, you know, adjusting your temperatures and encouraging, you know, the yeast even, you know, if you have to repitch, there's a whole science behind that too. And uh, I think we might have talked about that on one show or another as well, but uh, it might even be worth exploring again. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, there are uh, – and just uh, look up, uh, you know, just type it into Google, you know, repitch yeast, stall yeast. And there are several different methods out there that you can try to, to you know, recover uh, from a stall. But that's only after you've made corrections uh, and figured out what's what's wrong. Like, I, I'm, I'm suffering through one now. Chris and I have been working through one. It only happens with 71B, and it's happened on a couple of projects already. It, it ferments so far and then quits. Uh, it quit on my uh, on the Sourwood project. Uh, we started out at one three zero, and around one uh, you know zero five zero, it just quit. 
We repitched uh, East, made a starter, did a transfer, slow transfer and acclimation and all of that. Nothing. Uh, I just put it in a blanket, keeping it warm, uh, which is you know encourages the yeast to to try to you know keep keep going. And every once in a while, it'll it'll fart out a little bubble, and I check the hydrometer. Now it must be doing something because the hydrometer it, it dropped down. Uh, it's down around four zero now, but it just quit. Uh, had to do the same thing on another project. Same thing, seventy one B. It got down to zero five zero and just quit. Stop. pH is correct. Pitch rate was correct. I mean, everything was fine, you know. So <laughs> I don't know if it was a batch of yeast that I got, you know. Uh, Could be. Yeah, that's bizarre. I've yeah. not experienced that myself. Wild. Yeah. yeah, and, I, you know, Chris and I have worked through it, and right now we're at a loss. We, we've done everything. I mean, I you know, I ferment in stainless steel. They're covered. They're airtight. Temperature control is, you know, you know, basically within a degree because I've got a, a warming. There's a, a thing you can buy that you know will warm fermenters. It's like a big, almost like a like a uh, what do you call it? like a heating pad thing, uh, and it's uh, it's up against it's attached to the stainless steel, the neoprene condom that it, it's wrapped in basically so my temperature control is like spot on and uh you know between cooling and heating so i, I can take you know if it's set at 65 degrees it won't go more than 65.5 or 64.5 before one of the other kicks in so within one degree uh so i, I have no idea i have no idea you know um, wanted to wrap the show up here a little bit, talking about you know something we had on our on our to do list uh, was bottling preferences and corks. I mean, I don't know if you know when the last time you were at the at the homebrew store, mine has like buckets of corks all over the place. Uh. And all kinds of different kinds of things that you can cap a bottle with. I mean, from Zorks, I don't know if you guys, have, well, yeah, you've seen those. Those came on Sergio's uh, bottles of mead that he sent us. Uh, he uses Zorks. That's that plastic cork thing that, uh, you know, that he uses. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, there's there's the the neoprene, or not the neoprene, the uh, synthetic cork. Synthetic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the real cork uh, and cork. I mean, cork machines. I mean, there's the handheld Italian, or what do they call that thing? Uh, Italian something or Australian or whatever the hell it is. It's uh, handheld. Got the two handles on it. Uh, which are awkward, and then there's the floor corker type. Uh, but uh, let, let, let's uh, let's let's talk about your bottling preferences, uh, Jeff. <laughs> well, well uh, uh, Jeff. <laughs> let's see. As as far as wine bottles, um, I have one of those awkward uh, the levers with the two handles, um, and realistically, if you're going to go that route. Uh, you do want to use a, a natural cork just because the, the the synthetic ones are a little bit denser. They go in with a lot more trouble. Um, there are uh, there are also some some natural corks that are uh, uh, it's not a synthetic, but it's it's kind of like a um, almost like a particle board cork where they they yeah. they kind of pressure treat a bunch of different corks. Uh, and yeah. push them together into a cork form. Um, yeah, those are also, yeah, those are also a little too dense for that kind of a, a, a corker. Um, the uh, the now, floor, as I understand, the, uh, 
Uh, well, let, 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 let's explain the corker because I think you're talking about the same corker that I used to have. It doesn't compress the – it doesn't squeeze the cork. It actually forced the cork down through a smaller orifice into the bottle, right? Correct. It's – it's a narrowing tube, and it has a, a kind of a, just a piece of lever that pushes it down through there. Yeah, versus the this Italian floor corker or whatever the hell, the Australian or whatever the hell it is, it actually compresses the cork, then puts it into the bottle. So it mm-hmm. squeezes the cork, uh, uh, you know, compression, and then puts it in the bottle. But anyway, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, yeah, and I think there's actually – there's an Italian floor corker and a Portuguese floor corker, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong. Um, and the, the the action between the two is a little bit different. Um, each has their own um, their own camp of followers. Um, those are a little bit more where you see the ability to use the synthetic corks or the uh, that um, amalgamated cork. Um, that or, you know, a professional balling machine. How could anyone, one of us, afford that? Yeah. <laughs> um, actually, a lot of what I'm making, especially when I do one gallon, like little experimental batches, um, believe it or not, goes into 12 ounce beer bottles with a capper. Um, oh, really? Okay. The reason being, if, if I'm sending those to a competition, um, uh, they gen- generally tend to request 12 ounce beer bottles. Uh, with a generic cap and no label other than the one that gets rubber banded onto it. Yeah. Um, if I've got company over and I want to give them a little taste without opening a bottle and risking oxidizing the whole thing before I can drink it all, you know, 12 ounces is a lot better than 750 mils. Yeah. Um, so it, it tends to work out and I tend to use the larger wine bottles for the bigger batches I do. Uh, now, do you uh, where, where where do you get your wine bottles from? Actually, uh, my homebrew store has uh, has a deal worked out with um, a couple different wineries in the area where they get uh, used bottles. The labels are still attached, and then they'll sell those like resale for about fifty cents each. Oh. Um, I got started doing that, and I've been doing that for the longest time. But uh, one of my my best friend's, uh, his son is actually a bartender now and has been kind of holding them back for me mm-hmm. here and there. So I've, I've got a, a dirt cheap connection that way too. Yeah. Good point. I mean, that's, uh, you know, restaurants, uh, you know, that serve wine in your local community. Now be very careful because you can't use the bottles that have the screw on tops. Uh, do not uh, try to put a cork in those because you'll wind up crushing the bottle under the corker. Uh, you can only use the kind of bottle that, that had a cork in it to begin with. But that's a good point. Restaurants, uh, you know, local bars that serve wine, that's a good source. If you go in and talk to the owner, the bartender, and, uh, you know, have them save back, you know, the, the bottles for you. Um and uh, delabeling them is a simple process. And I'll tell you, the, the one, uh, what I use, uh, it, typically I'll put the bottle under hot water and let the, let, let the label soak uh, for a few minutes. And then I've got this really long razor blade like, like uh, it's hard to describe. It's a, it's a big stainless steel knife that I use. It, it's got this uh, big blade. It's like four inches by five inches with a handle on it, it 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 almost works like almost like a razor blade. I can slide it under the label and, and usually peel it off. But that being said, there's oftentimes there's residue from the glue, and mm-hmm. what I use are equal pa- e- equal part of uh, equal parts of baking soda and olive oil, and huh. just simply wet a sponge. Uh, ring the sponge. I just want a wet sponge and then just dab it into that solution and just work it on the bottle. The olive oil acts as the solvent while the baking soda acts as the abrasive. And it'll take that, uh, take that stuff off. So just a little, another little tidbit. <laughs> um, I actually just use powdered brewery wash. Uh, there you go. Yeah, you buy it on Amazon. Um, 
Oh, oh my God. If, if I had realized sooner that it was available on Amazon as cheap as it is, I would have been using a lot more of it. Um, it's a great household cleaner too, but it's, it's one of those, uh, high alkaline cleaners kind of in the same vein as like a, a bleach or an oxyclean. Uh-huh. Um, but it fill up a, a tub of hot water, mix in a really small amount of oxyclean, um, and, uh, let that sit for about half an hour. And it tends to actually just dissolve most of the glues that use, um, that, uh, affix labels with. Yeah. So you, and literally just slide the label right off. Uh, there's very little residue to work out. Um, I, I tried it and would never go back. There are a few labels that are super snickety that way and are harder to work with, but, um, absolutely powdered brewery wash. Cannot say enough good things about it. <laughs> Aaron, so, what's your, uh, what's your bottling preferences? Well, I'm just taking notes right now of all of these <laughs> these great tips you guys are sharing with with getting that um, the label glue off. Because gosh, what a pain! I usually in the past have just used the hot water and soap method, where I'm getting like a sponge or something and just scrubbing, 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 and, and yeah. it just takes forever to get that stuff off. So some some really good tips there. Uh, no, for me, what what I usually have done in the past is also just the the brown beer bottles. Um, with, you know, crown caps over the years, I've collected some just different sizes of beer bottles. I've, I've actually got a few six ounce bottles, which are perfect for, you know, individual size samples of, of trying something that, you know, you put in the bottle and you don't want to drink too much of it, but you want to have a sample a little bit earlier on before it's had a chance to age, really like those six ounce size bottles. Probably the majority of what I use are, are the 12 ounce size, but then I've also got some, some 24 ounce bottles as well. Um, and then as far as the caps, I've been using these oxygen barrier caps. Um, they're a little bit more expensive than the, the regular caps, but uh, evidently they prevent oxygen from, from coming through. So Okay. That's that's what I've been using. Interesting. Uh, yeah. So we've got corks and beer bottles being used. Uh, I've never used a beer bottle. I mean, my, my experience with beer bottles isn't going to come uh, for another row, oh, probably about another 10 days or so when my pumpkin beer is ready to bottle. So that'll be my first experience with a uh, with a beer. Uh, beer bottle and a cap and a, and a bottle or, uh, you know, the capper part. But mm-hmm. typically I, I mean, I, you know, I, I use, um, I use wine bottles, uh, and I get the, the regular, well, I guess, I don't know. What did you call them, Jeff? They're not, they're not completely cork, but they're not completely synthetic. They're like part cork and part something else. It's. Uh, I refer to them as amalgamated. I'm not sure if that's the actual term for them, but yeah, uh, um, like compressed cork fibers. Yeah, those, those are the ones that I that I use. Um, I have used real cork before, but there's like a whole involved rehumidi- uh, rehumidifying process that you have to go through with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if you want to keep your mead for an extended period of time, because you know this whole cork thing, you know, it, it's not it's not just a matter of throwing a cork in a bottle and putting it away for a couple of years, because sometimes that just isn't going to work because the cork uh, won't uh, the cork will breathe too much, and uh, it'll ruin your your bottle of. Uh, so there's there's a whole science behind corks. Uh, that I knew nothing about uh, until I started, you know, buying them. Um, and so you got to be careful. Now, those corks that you're talking about, the, the ones that I use, they're good for a couple of years. Uh, but if you intend on keeping your mead uh, in a bottle using those corks longer than that, you need to go to regular cork corks. And there's like a whole... I don't know if you guys are familiar with this whole rehydration process that you have to go through with them. Yeah, they're, to an extent, the cork fibers need to be 
uh, need to have a, a level of humidity in them. And uh, this is also a reason they, they recommend working them on their sides so that they maintain that humidity. Yeah. Um, I was actually reading over the weekend uh, an interview that uh, Ken Schramm did where he was talking about using um, only only a pretty high-quality cork with his meads. Uh, but the reason behind that was because it does allow them to breathe in a very, uh, very controlled and very uh, minuscule way. Um, and that way, in over the course of up to 20 years, uh, the mead can kind of slowly age and, and get more character to it in a, in a desirable way. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a the whole, uh, you know, and of course, I mean, the average mead maker, I mean, you don't find this kind of information just, just blatantly out there. I mean, this is stuff that I've only learned through talking to professional people, people like the, the, the one, uh, the other homebrew store that I go to, the guy that owns it, it's an older gentleman who actually owns a winery uh, up north uh, on the coast uh, in Ventura County. And uh, he's the one that was explaining to me about the whole rehydration process and what kind of corks to use. And I was actually using the wrong corker for those corks that, that he does not recommend handled uh, deal that uh, you were describing Jeff mm -hmm. uh, you know you need to use the one that actually compresses the cork before it goes into the bottle not as it's going into the bottle so that would be that Portuguese or Italian floor corker right um, and uh, you know and and you know this all leading up to you know his first question was well, how long is it going to be in the bottle? And I, 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 I initially thought, well, that's an odd question. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't know how, how long it's going to be in the bottle. Well, how long do you intend on, on aging it? And I then never dawned on me, you know, uh, I didn't have any idea. So this is when he started in his whole conversation about these corks. So learn about corking. I mean, if we can leave you with something here tonight about corking and bottling, uh, one, you don't have to buy brand new bottles. Okay, you can, uh, you know, go to your you know, local restaurants in town where you live, local bars uh, that serve wine. Ask them to save, and most of them will. I mean, they're they're pretty generous that way. I mean, they 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 serve no value to the bar uh, once they're empty. Uh, they're either, Usually, you're saving them from the effort of recycling. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, so, you know, you can you can usually stock up, uh, you know, a pretty pretty decent supply. Now, you may not get into the three seventy fives; those are a little hard to come by in a in a bar or a lounge or a restaurant somewhere. But for the seven fifties, uh, that's that's an actually uh, a very good resource. And if you don't care what size, like I could care less. Um, I, I don't care. You know, I don't care what shape that the seven fifties are in. Uh, I don't even care what color they are. I tend to stay away from the clear ones. Uh, only I'll only use clear ones if I'm doing a clear mead, like a traditional. Uh, anything with uh, with fruit or anything else, like you know, you want to use the darker bottles. Uh, but that's a good resource, you know. The 750, the, the 375s, yeah, you probably wind up at your homebrew store. Amazon, sometimes you can get a decent deal on Amazon, but you really got to look hard. Most of those are coming from homebrew stores anyway. Mm -hmm. So the deals you get on Amazon aren't really all that good. Um, but shop around. Um, corks, learn about corks. Uh, you know, and and, and I, I highly recommend the four core group. Eighty bucks, uh, usually between seventy five and, and eighty ninety dollars for a good floor corker. Absolutely worth the investment. Absolutely worth the investment, uh, and it'll do big bottles and little bottles. Uh, there's even attachments for them that you can do uh, beer bottles. Haven't looked into that yet. And also for the, uh, oh, gosh, 
we in in one and not the other. Um, oh come on, what's the other? Uh, Jesus, the uh, <laughs> I swear to God, there you go, champagne. Yeah, yeah, because that's a whole different kind of bottling process as well, mm-hmm. uh, or corking process. So you just you just can't champagne cork down through one of these corkers and expect it to work. Ain't gonna fly. Uh, but there's attachments out there for for these different floor corkers. So, but um, and I do have a bit of bad news. We lost the first part of the show. <laughs> oh no! Yeah, I got I got like an hour and nine minutes of it. So the, basically, the part that we dropped was. Uh, I think the li- I'm sure the live part went out. The recorded part, it quit right after we got started. I wasn't able to get it started uh, for like 20 minutes. Uh, but uh, it's just all we lost was the opening part and uh, the part where we were talking about the coffee. So we picked it up at the tail end of the coffee. But anyway, we'll get uh, we'll get what left up there on the show, a little over an hour's worth. So some good discussion in there. Uh, we'll get that up and get it posted uh, for the folks. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, computers, stuff happens. Uh, a reward for those that are listening live. Yeah, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, every once in a while, you know, and it's only been since I've been on this Windows 10. And I don't know that ha- I, I, I'm not convinced that Windows 10 is – you know, it's still pretty much in its infancy when you you know when you think about it. But uh, I've had some minor issues with Windows 10. I don't know if this is related or not, but uh, you know we have a we have, you know the way this thing works. There's two encoders on on the program, and one records and records to the hard drive. The other uh, encodes and sends it out to the live stream. And they both start at the same time. Uh, well, once in a while, uh, and this has happened to us before, the one that records to the hard drive, it just quits. And I can't get it restarted. And, and you know, it just something happens and all of a sudden it'll start up again and, and take off. But anyway, so sorry, folks. Lost about the first 20 minutes. Hey, you know what? Technology, it's not 100%. But, uh, you know, uh, I like to hang around and yak, but uh, I think we pretty much run out of time here. Uh, good discussions tonight, guys. Uh, you know, educational. I think. You know, we learned a few things. Oh, definitely. Good to be back after our, our two week break. Definitely good to be back in the meat house. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, oh, go ahead, Jeff. I was just saying it is good to be back. Yep. Uh, you know, and I, yeah, I forgot to ask you at the top of the uh, top of the show. How's the bees? Oh well, um, the uh, it's still a little hit or miss. My my one hive is uh, it's in the middle of a summer flow, and uh, they're constantly busy. They're 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 going like gangbusters. Um, my other hive, I'm I'm still stressing over. I think. Uh, the, the queen that I tried to replace was rejected. I, I don't know if I mentioned that in the previous show. And uh, they they had – the last time I checked, they had four candidates for a new queen um, that they were just starting to uh, to, to build ne- – um, not nests, build cells for. Um, so I need to check on the project of – the progress of those. Yeah. And uh, we'll kind of go from there. Yeah. Yeah, I think you had mentioned that you had purchased a new queen and was in the process of incorporating that into the into the, one of the hives. But uh, well, that's unfortunate. Uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, I'm sure that you'll get it together and uh, start uh, start uh, you know producing some good honey there. Well, here's hoping. May uh, if if these candidates don't work out, my last hope for the season for this hive is to kind of steal a uh, a frame full of fresh eggs from the hive that's doing really well, um, and try to to transplant into this new hive so that they have some more stock to try and build a queen with. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, 
you know, I, I listen to you talk about your bees, and then the guy I buy honey from, gosh, he makes it look so simple. Uh, you know, I mean, he, you know, I, I was teasing everybody about you naming.